and here we are. How many times have we tried to make this work? And it took us some time, but we managed. Totally. It's been a few months, but we finally had like a merging of a schedule situation. So, you know, we're, we're making it. I know, but because you've been so busy though, too, there's so much going on with you. Do you mind telling us a little bit what you've been up to? Yeah, well, I... Just as a means of introduction, I am a designer and I'm a partner at Pentagram, which is a fairly big design firm. And so I run a team of people um, here at Pentagram. And yeah, work has been pretty busy in January and here early February. Um, but yeah, I'm finally happy to have a conversation with you. Terrific. Where are you at right now? Are you in New York? I'm in New York. Um, I live in Brooklyn, but my office is in Manhattan. So I'm in Manhattan right now. Are you one of those that cannot see yourself living anywhere else but New York, you're in New York through and through? Well, I'm from Italy originally, and I moved to yeah. New York 12 years ago, um, at this point, almost 12 years ago. And I really, really love New York. Now, will I see myself living someplace else? I think I would like to retire in Italy. Like, that's the plan. <laughs> but as far as work is concerned, no, I think that New York is uh, is my place. Funnily enough, we have an office in Austin as well, where you are right now. So Pentagram has an office there, too. That's exciting. Well, next time you're down here, we're going to go out and get some barbecue. Absolutely. I know a lot of Italians that adopt New York as their hometown and everything they believe in New York is the best city in the world. And you mentioned that right now for work seems to be the best place for you. As that has always been a plan as well, once you finish school to go to New York and that's where you wanted to pursue the career? Actually, no, <laughs> I didn't even think about it. So I have a, a master in architecture. And so I finished my architecture studies when I was you know, 24 and I worked for a bit in Italy. So for four or five years, I was in Milan working in interaction design um, and, you know, sort of like getting started after architecture to really go a bit more into design. Uh, and the reason why I came to New York is that I also started a PhD in design at Milan Politecnico. And within the PhD course, I had an opportunity to do six months of a visiting researcher um, period abroad. And there was this really small lab at Parsons in New York that at the time was called the Parsons Institute for Information Mapping. Now I believe it's called something like Center for Data Art Studies or something like that. Um, and I was very, very intrigued into data and data visualization. And so I really wanted to go into that um, little lab. Um, and long story short, I really thought that my New York experience had an expiration date after my six months. But I still remember that at the time with my um, ex boyfriend and husband um, at the time, you know, day number three, we were out and having dinner. And I'm like, we have to figure out a way to live here. So <laughs> definitely felt in love with the city right away. Was that the first time that you were introduced to data visualization when you went to the lab in Pratt? Uh, well, at Milan Politecnico, I was already studying within um, a lab called Density Design Lab that was actually doing data visualization. So um, I already got started with my PhD. Um, and um, also, I co-founded with my ex and another partner a data visualization design company in Milan in uh, 2010. That then, you know, as we came to New York, we opened the New York office. So let's say that um, around 2010, I was introduced to data visualization. But honestly, in retrospect, even my architecture master thesis was an information design project focusing on um, like urban mapping and mapping underutilized spaces and um, you know places in a specific region of Italy that one could repurpose for cultural events. And so there was a, like a fair amount of almost like data collection about all these places and mapping them. Um, so I've been really, really always interested in uh, mapping and analyzing information and then representing it visually. Is that something that you always had it with you? Were you like the little girl that like maps and coloring yeah. and creating way, different ways to expl explain things? Yes. Uh, you know, I always recall this anecdote where, um, you know, I, I remember it fairly well, but my mom and at the time my grandmother, when she was alive, kept making fun of me because I spent a lot of time when I was a kid in my grandmother's tailor shop. So she was a seamstress. Uh, and had all these like buttons, ribbon, threads, all these materials. And I would just lay them all out on the table. And every day, or say every time that I was there, I would organize them according to different
certain principles such as color, size, the length of a ribbon, or whether a button had one hole, two holes, four holes. And I think that that was already a form of obsessive data organization in a way. Uh, but but to me, the the interest since I was a kid was not like data itself, but it was the visual organization of things in a way. Yeah, because there's a, quite a bit of a challenge in navigating those, the, the, the translation between complex data and also creating a visually like engaging in a way that people can understand what you try to convey. Is that a, at, we've been doing this for quite some time right now. Do you have a formula to kind of make sure that you can represent your idea in the best clear possible way? Because, you know, you definitely, the, the two go person for a lot of you know, really <laughs> respectful uh, uh, newspapers and media outlets to explain people what's going on in a very uh, interesting way. Well, thank you. Um, I don't believe that I have necessarily a formula because it very much depends on the context and even the output of the data visualization. So designing for a newspaper or a magazine is very different than designing for an exhibition or designing for a digital experience. And so depending on uh, the constraint in terms of the final output and also the type of client, am I designing for like a corporate um, company? Company that has to, you know, in a way, talk to their customers? Am I designing for an NGO that has to spread a message? Am I designing for an art institution that, you know, wants to commission a work of art that has uh, data embedded in it? So all of these really sort of like dictate the process. Um, but there are certain rules in terms of how you translate quantities and categories into, you know, visual expressions in a way. I always start by thinking about what is the architecture of the visualization, I would call it, which is, you know, are we organizing data by time or by rankings or by macro grouping or is there a geographic component? And I think that whether you're doing it digitally or in a magazine or, um, you know, in a physical space, that is always the entry point because it is how you ultimately shape the story that people will sort of like interact with in a way. And that's the point I want to touch base because your work often bridges that gap between like data and storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you choose the stories you want to tell through your visualization in the projects that you're interested in? Yeah. So again, it, it kind of depends because I have been working on a fair amount of personal projects where, you know, personal data collection um, was the way for me to tell a story about myself or a topic that I was interested in. And in that case, again, it's very, very personal. It's what I find the most interesting pattern in the data that I'm collecting about myself. Um, then if you're like usually working with clients, um, it's, it's really intriguing for me because you interact with them and they are the subject matter expert. You know, me and my team, we're designers and uh, we can certainly just help with even the storytelling process. But interacting with them is the way that we start to understand what is that that is more important and urgent to tell what can be an angle that is you know particularly interesting for this topic because people don't know about that and so there's a fair amount of interaction with uh, the subject matter expert whether again it's a client or if it is for a cultural institution the curator of the exhibition um, and we do a fair amount of data research ourselves but again I feel that most of the time, um, again, interacting with the, the commissioner in a way is the way that together we figure out what's the best story to tell. I'm just finishing by saying that some other times um, it's really completely up to us and a client calls us because they want fresh eye in terms of, okay, here's a fair amount of data that we have uh, and we have a few hunches, but please tell us what you think that will resonate the most. And in those cases, Sometimes we also just go out and look for other data, maybe more contextual and anecdotal, qualitative details that can make people relate to the topic a little bit more than just an aggregated big data set in a way. But now talking collecting data and you have done so many of those data visualizations, do you have a sense of what, which kind of format resonates better with people? Huh. Um... I wouldn't say that there's a form that resonates better. I mm -hmm. feel that, you know, you touched upon it yourself. People resonate with stories. I don't think that people really resonate with cold and crude facts. Facts can be the anchoring point for a story. And 
what resonates with people is something that they can just sort of like relate back to something they're experiencing on on their daily life. And so, for example, you know, stories that have a local component, or I always make this example where if we're talking about climate change, sure, we are alarmed by temperature risings and glaciers melting and all these forecasts about the future. But I think we get more alarmed and hopefully we can change some behaviors when we see things that are in our environment that say we'll not be able to see anymore because of climate change. An example is all the birds that you're never going to be able to hear anymore in Central Park because they're migrating due to temperature rising as opposed to just a big trend of temperature risings or the cities that you will not be able to visit anymore because they're going to be drowning because of the sea level rising. So I, I really think that people relate with more micro consequences than bigger trends. Do, doing a little reading about you before we get a chance to have this conversation, I kind of fell in love with the idea of the data data. And I was so curious about like the initial inspiration, you know, how that came to be. Can you give me a little bit about like those early days? Yeah. Day and <laughs> day wow. So for your listeners, Dear Data is a project that um, it's a collaboration with information designer and data artist Stephanie Pozovic. Right now we're friends, uh, but we didn't know each other really before starting the project. We only met once at a conference called IO that was a, um, you know, it's still going on. It's a media art and, and data visualization conference in Minneapolis. And we met there in 20. 13. So that was like 10 years ago, pretty much. Um, and we discovered that we have so many similarities, both of us working with data from a design perspective, both of us were giving, I was giving a talk and she was t teaching a workshop about drawing with data. And so really thinking about data, leaving technology out and what can that teach you about the very nature of data. Uh, same age, both only children. I'm an Italian living in New York. She's an American living in London and many, many other similarities. And we decided that we had to collaborate. Um, so, you know, after a bit of back and forth, after the conference, we decided to try to get to know each other through data only. And so we started the year long data correspondence where pretty much we were not allowed to text, like to say or to write anything, but just collect data on a weekly basis on a shared topic and then send each other these data postcards across the ocean where the front of the postcard was the data drawing and the back of the postcard contained the address of the other person and the legend, how to interpret those drawings. And, and the topics were fairly mundane from our interaction to our partners, to our thoughts and emotions, to the sounds that we could hear around us. A way to paint a full portrait of who we are and where we live in 52 weeks. Um, and yeah, the, the project got pretty viral. Um, I think it's important to say that we didn't only quantify the number of times that we talked to our partners in a week, for example, but we added context and details about what was happening, where we angry or excited, what was the situation, to really use data as a pretext to um, share ourselves with the other person one subject and one layer at a time. Pretty obsessive. And so no, I mean, it's fascinating. And day one, we're already set up like the perimeter, similar. Like, we're going to do this for 52 weeks. And <laughs> it was like already prearranged before or organically kind of just happened. It actually was prearranged before. Both of us, I think, working with this systemic view of design, wanted to have parameters set for the project before it began. Um, and so again, we went back and forth. We had a few Zoom calls, or maybe at the time it was Skype calls, I don't remember, um, thinking about, okay, maybe we can start a spreadsheet of topics. And the topics, um, we had a few in the beginning, but then those were more organically added to the spreadsheet. And, you know, we had a few that we wanted to do, but then as you start to look at your days through data, you understand what can be other topics that we haven't thought of um, in the beginning that could be interesting to explore. So I believe that say the first seven weeks were set, but then we would just like each add to the spreadsheet. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but the format was um, already set. We both got a stack of like thick paper. It was a letter size for me and an A4. Of course, she's European, like she's in Europe yeah. for Stephanie. And we will cut these, um, uh, you know, letter size paper in two and the postcard would be half of it. 
Um, so completely, the postcard was also all completely drawn, like the back, we would draw the lines uh, to host the address. And um, we, we've been really curious, and we haven't really figured that out, but what would our mailmen think for a year when they picked up <laughs> the postcards and <laughs> found this drawing? Some of the postcards got lost, some arrived to the other person pretty damaged, which is kind of fascinating, because, you know, one that I drew with some markers that were water markers for some reason got completely washed <laughs> um, but we, we, we like to think that the postal service was the third party in this collaboration yeah it is true and i'm, I'm, I'm assuming the point was ours at the one after the 52 weeks you would share that with the world you would display and let people see the result of that that experiment uh yeah you know because we do both of us used to just you know give public talks and talk about our work we thought that at the very minimum we would make it like you know an online project and talk about it mm -hmm. in talks um but when we shared it we actually shared it before finishing the project so we arrived at week 10 or 12 and at that point we knew that we could keep going um, and so we started to put on a website and it was interesting because in the first year, then the people who followed us were waiting for the weekly just scanned postcard to appear. Um, and then Maria Popova of Brain Pickings, um, which is like a, a pretty famous uh, blog that um, covers literary fiction and nonfiction, picked up the project uh, and she has a ton of followers. And so from there on, it became pretty viral. And I remember that in the original article at the end, she put a note that said, these calls for editors and publishers to just, you know, make a book of. Um, and so we got a book contract um, and the um, original collection of postcards and sketchbooks that we did in preparation of the weekly drawing got acquired by the Museum of Modern Art as part of the permanent collection. So that was very exciting. But I have to tell you, Yuri, what was even more exciting is that Dear Data um, really was adopted as a format from people all around the world, not designers, non-artists, just people that learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves. And even by teachers from any grade to teach their students the world of data. So to me, that has been even more compelling than the book or the acquisition, if it makes sense. Were you surprised with the success and how, as you mentioned, you went viral, you reached so many accolades and so much, so many things has happened. Were you surprised with that? Or you had a sense that, listen, we're doing something very interesting and different. I think we, we got something going on over here. You know, I, I really thought that we were up to something because I think it was also a moment in time where, I mean, right now, probably this warmest and less conventional representation of data are a bit more um, just widespread. But really 10 years ago, a lot of the data visualization community was heavily technology driven. And so, you know, most of the people in the data visualization community were computer scientists or coders, creative coders. And we really, you know, thought that ultimately this like warmer and more human and actually more down to the essence approach could shine a light onto the very nature of data. What, what is data in the end? It's an abstraction of our lives that you can look at one subject at a time. And to me, sometimes when we get tangled up into technology or these libraries that you use to visualize data, these, you know, kind of like technological libraries, you, you lose track of what really matters. Um, so yeah, you know, I think that we were up to something. Now, would have I imagined that it would become a book, a couple of exhibition would be acquired. And then now there's Google groups of teachers all around the world that share the, the way that they teach their data. No, maybe, but um, again, I, I really thought that there was something there that really needed to be shared. I, I love the story. It's fascinating. What did you learn about yourself during the process? Is there anything mm. in particular that you kind of, oh my goodness, you kind of were able to you know, <laughs> deep, dig, deep, you know, dig deeper of you and figure it out? Oh my goodness, I didn't even realize I have all those different feelings and, and emotions and thoughts. Yeah. Well, you know, the project is 10 years old almost, so I might just maybe remember the highlights, but. First of all, I learned how to pay attention because that like methodical observation about yourself and your surrounding is something that you don't do on a daily basis. You just like usually go about the world. I mean, I'm not 
I'm not really advising that anybody starts an obsessive 52 weeks, like a daily data collection, but, you know, really you learn how to observe and to observe the details and to stop and record. And so I think it's almost, you know, now we all talk about mindfulness, but it's almost been like a year of profound mindfulness in a way. Um, then there's particular weeks where I've uh, realized a few things. So one week where we collected um, the, the, all the times that we say thank you to somebody. And in my data collection, I collected who I say thank you uh, to, what was it for, was it really meant, or was it just a courtesy thank you, and some other mm -hmm. details. And I really realized, really, truly, at the end of the week that I say thank you so many times to strangers like waiters or, you know, people that open the door for me in a place. Uh, but I don't thank enough the people who are closer to me, which probably we all do. Um, another week that we um, recorded complaints and say, who were we complaining to? What was that about? Was it really necessary? I really realize how many times I'm just really venting about things that I should keep my mind shut, you know, then complaining excessively about, oh my God, how cold is it? Or this printer is not working. Like things that, you know, I could really even keep for myself. I think you mentioned earlier that the early days of data visualization was very much around computer scientists. It was a different community than what has become more recently. Then. There's a creative aspect right now that people are quite interested. But I think that's because data has become such a crucial part of everybody's life. It doesn't yes. matter. You know, uh, even young kids are getting familiar with the idea and uh, what it means to be data. Now, what I'm curious is at what point in the decision making process as a human being of a company, are we, do you believe we're going too hard on data and perhaps letting go of the less scientific approach, less of making decisions, such as like a gut feeling, for example? Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I think that in all of the let's say new hypes, there's a moment of a peak and a bubble. And then there's a moment where we get back to what really matters and we employ these whatever technology or in this case data in a way that is more um, naturally ingrained in processes. So I feel that right now, for the most part, we are over the hype of data tells us everything, or at least, you know, I believe that we're heading towards that because data is not perfection. Data is not a perfect representation of reality. Data is one of the tools that you have to analyze the situation, but ultimately you have to decide based on your knowledge, on your um, understanding of the situation. Again, data is a tool like stakeholders interviews are a tool. Um, I think that more and more we're understanding that data needs to be taken that way and ultimately big decisions, sure, are not made on a whim and are made based on an analysis of the data, but ultimately matched um, with, again, a personal understanding, hopefully. Are you excited about all the new you know, technologies that's happening right now? I mean, there's, of course, a lot of conversation about AI and uh, Apple just came up with their augmented reality goggles and all those things. So that will really transform a little bit, enhance the data visualization, even the design aspect of the business and, and the world, is that something that excites you or or you kind of a little bit more like, you know, let's just slow down a little bit and kind of go back to basics? You know, ultimately it excites me. I think that we can't get back to a world where AI doesn't exist. And so it's about figuring out how to actually use it as, again, another tool. Um, with my team at Pentagram, we're, we're using it for different reasons. I think that ultimately, it comes down always to an intention, like even just if, you know, it's really about the prompt that you use. What are you asking this very intelligent tool to do for you? So I still think that there's an intentionality that distinguishes the human touch. And, um, you know, there's a lot of conversations about all oh, design jobs will go away because of AI. I don't think so. You know, I think that as when, um, a calculator <laughs> or the computer got introduced, there are certain jobs that um, just became a little less, um, I don't know, prominent. And, uh, and these will probably happen. I think it's mostly on executional aspects of it. Uh, but again, I still think that ultimately the human craft and the way that a human thinks, knowing the context, 
might still win. Now, I might be a bit of a naive optimist, but um, I still believe in the human power to use technology for the better good. <laughs> well, to be determined, we shall see. Yes, I, I'm right. with well, you, though. We'll talk I'm next year. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we share this, this, the same sent sentiment. Uh, how are you introducing or using AI uh, in the firm? How are you implementing that in your, uh, in your career right now? Well, um, you know, again, I work with a team of amazing designers who are younger than me and more technically skilled than me. And so my job and my role at Pentagram is as a director, a creative director. I work on concepts and um, we're using tools like DALI or Meet Journey, which are like primarily generating images in a way at the beginning of the processes, almost as if it was another young designer that we can have on the team that generates new idea. Um, this is one way that we use it. Another way that we use it is to, to, you know, add plugins to the software that we use all the time, like Figma or even the Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator Suite suit, uh, to create, say, patterns in an easy way. But in that case, when we're using it more for executions, it's a prototyping tool. Like very rarely we present to a client a product of AI. We use it to see quickly how it might look like. Um, and then there's a fair amount of design craft that that still goes into the final product. Um, now, this is just the way we use it. Other times we're using it to help us do some research, like preliminary research about a project or data research. Um, but yeah, we haven't, you know, I haven't used it yet to replace one of my employees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I almost feel like it's a way to exercise, right? It's a way to kind of push back in terms of ideas, concepts yeah. that you can uh, explore a little bit different, but it's not a final product. You need to refine it. You need people to be around to kind of you know, put a context to what's going on and elevate it to in, in a way that people can understand. It can be presented to a client or an exhibition. But I, I do feel like it's, it's a great tool just to bounce back ideas. It's almost like a brainstorm exercise, you know, with AI. Now, do you feel like, because I had this conversation with a lot of people, that AI is pulling data from what's taught, right? But when we're looking to ethnical architecture and design, there's not a lot of information around it. So when you try to, you know, ask for something specific for certain parts of the world, certain regions of the world, it doesn't really have enough uh, data to come up with something, you know, interesting enough. How important is for us not only use AI, but also make sure that the, the libraries have mm. all the right numbers, right, the right data to make sure when the question is being asked, it's providing the best answer possible. Absolutely. This is incredibly important. I, I believe that we're still in a place where we have to build those data sets that are feeding our AI algorithms. There's a lot about, of course, data sets and information and tradition about the Western world. And I think that that is a limitation. Uh, you know, as, as, as we know, we're also feeding AI data sets that like come from the past where even, you know, important topics like gender have been mostly throughout the years looked at as binary, where maybe women didn't even have enough, you know, seats at the table. Uh, so I think that there's been a lot of conversation around ethic and data that feed AI we're not there yet to have a very comprehensive mm -hmm. data set of the world but you know sometimes I even think like inequalities are unfortunately part of our world and that is kind of reflected in the data that we have uh, so of course the problem would be to just keep perpetuating these inequalities over and over um, but I really think it's really a problem of our culture and our moment in time to try to pay much more attention into what are those gaps that need to be filled and mended in a way um, from the inequalities that and the disparities that we have in our world and I almost in an optimistic way, think that AI can even shine a brighter light onto those. Again, it all comes down to who uses those tools and for what, but I think that there is really, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's my skewed algorithm, but I feel like, you know, <laughs> there's more and more conversations that are Mm, widespread and known from pretty much everybody about what are the risks that we should really pay high attention to. Hey, maybe Yuri, I'm such a naive optimist, but that's how I see it now. No, I think there's a lot of people on that side uh, on the line as well that agrees with you. And I, I, I thank you for sharing us, you know, your, your opinion on this. I think it's super relevant. And coming from somebody who is, you know, a, a leader and a subject in, a, in someone who is very much involved, 
I think it just, you know, elevates the whole conversation even further. But <laughs> now my question is, we're early in the year, 2024. What's the big plan for this year? What, there's any big exhibition, any big projects that you, we're going to be seeing in the next few months? Yes. Let me think about what I can tell you. Um, well, I have a book coming out um, that okay. will be available for pre-orders at the end of March, uh, but I think it's going to be really in print and available on Amazon and all the places in May, to be realistic. Um, and uh, to try to not give it away too much is actually, and maybe you won't believe that, but a kid's book a picture book for kids that hopefully will teach them about data without even mentioning the word data. So that was the challenge. Um, and I've always really wanted to do a picture book and it's a collaboration with uh, Madeline Gardner who works with me here at Pentagram. So um, it's like the two of us co-authoring the book. Um, I've always wanted to do a picture book. One of those books that are for kids, but that adults might want to pick and have um, in their home. I, you know, I don't know if, if, if you have like, you know, if it just rings a bell, um, that could really get to the essence of what it means to be a human being through the lens of observation and catalog cataloging and categorization uh it's almost like um a story version of dear data if you will that's fascinating well i know i'm gonna get a copy because i have an 11 year old at home that wants to be in robotics so oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so i i think it's gonna have to be a must a must one here for the house very excited are you someone who needs to always find yourself chasing for new challenges i mean yeah you're yeah, always looking for the next thing. Gosh, yes. This is something that I'm working with my therapist on <laughs> because I feel that, I mean, I, I don't know. It, 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 I'm very, very motivated to, to do things and to make and I thrive when I have new projects. Um, at the same time, I feel that at, at times it had been almost like an obsession to figure out what is the next thing even before I finish something um and so i think i'm working a little bit more on enjoying the fruits of a labor as opposed to always looking into oh my god what am i doing next um i've also learned that the more that you put out work the more that opportunities just come because people see your work you might have ideas um so but yeah in general i really feel good when i'm designing and when i'm thinking about new projects um i'm i'm excited i had been experiencing in the past few years some health challenges i don't know if you've seen the new york time piece that yes. i put out of my journey with long covid um and knock on wood i'm feeling much better so i feel that i have this renewed enthusiasm for actually looking a bit outside of myself and my symptoms and the prognosis of my illness and um, just, you know, really start to, to think about the work that I want to put out. That's so happy to hear and seeing that you're getting better and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and, you know, the future is bright. And uh, yeah. that's just terrific. There's a couple of questions Thanks. that I ask almost everybody that come here to the show. So we're going to go ahead and do a quick uh, rapid fires with you. And number one is the best compliment you ever got. Wow, the best compliment. <laughs> okay, you're gonna laugh. The best compliment I've ever had is when people tell me, "Oh my God, your English is great," because <laughs> English is my second language, and I yeah. learned it just coming here ten years ago. Um, and I really almost didn't speak a word of English before, and I'm really also trying to not have that thick Italian accent. So another version of this compliment that I like is when people cannot place my accent, and they're like, "Yeah, you have an accent." but we can't really figure out where you're from. That's funny. No, listen, I'm a foreigner too, so I, I get it. As soon as I'm, oh my goodness, your English is so good. I'm like, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take all the compliments possible. By the way, uh, you speak English great. <laughs> oh, thank you. So do you. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you had the chance to exchange plays with anybody in the world, mm. who would it be? Wow. Um, I have to choose who to change places with. That's very tricky. Do all your guests have a rapid fire answer to this one? No rapid fire. Sometimes I got I like to put it in the spot, you know, give it a moment to think about it. And it Okay, I, I know who I would trade places with uh, that is a bit of an imaginary figure is a version of me that is 100% healthy and a little taller <laughs> and um, 
I probably, honestly, probably that's it. It's like I would trade place with somebody who's 100% healthy and didn't have like a lot of health issues, um, but it's pretty much a designer doing what I do because I love my job so much. I love New York. I love my partner. I can't really imagine um, anything else besides, again, being 100% healthy. So you are changing place with your future self on the high heels. Yes. Right? <laughs> That's funny. Totally. I'll have to there you go. wear heels. There we go. Now, going back to future selves, if you had a chance to go back in time hmm. and meet a five-year-old Georgia, what would you tell her? Um, oh, my God. Yeah. I would tell her that you don't have to have it all figured out right now, that you know, living life and going through the motions and just, you know, being open to opportunities is the way to have fun. I think when I was a kid and a young teenager, I really wanted to already have a plan. And the fact that I didn't know what to respond when people asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, there were all these kids that were able to say, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be an astronaut. I just like had no idea. And that made me feel very uncomfortable. So I would tell her that it's really okay to not have it all figured out because otherwise the future is pretty boring. Now, I want you to recommend us a book. It can be something that you read recently or your favorite book, something that you should, mm -hmm. should go ahead and pick it up. Well, you know, because I have been digging into the world of illnesses in a way, there was a book that stuck out that might not you know, maybe resonate with a lot of people, but I think it's important, which is called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's a really interesting piece of nonfiction with also particular stories in it that really talk about how any trauma or um, things that you're going through mentally, any stressors or, you know, things that you haven't really processed in the past keeps adding up. And at some point, your body would really tell you that it's time to change, slow down or take care of yourself in a different way. And I found that piece of writing really interesting and fascinating. Again, I might be biased because I've been going through some health issues, but I think it really is interesting for everybody. No, of course. Uh, what about a, a movie, something to watch? It can be a movie or a TV show? Oh, a uh, TV show, I would say. We, with my partner, had been really obsessed with Succession. I don't know if you saw it. It's a very famous HBO series yeah. with this, uh, you know, millionaires who are owning like a TV network and it's based in New York. And, um, you know, we started to watch it like a year ago. And uh, yeah, we kind of loved it. I think there's this dynamics between the characters who are like, these very unreachable, very wealthy characters that is, is very compelling. The acting's good. Um, well, another one that we really enjoyed, I'm just going to say too, uh, is White Lotus, uh, which is this other series that mm -hmm. has, you know, two seasons. The second season is in Italy, which I found particularly uh, compelling for me. Um, and again, the plot and the characters is intriguing and funny and, um, you know, those two are some of those shows that every Monday or, you know, after the episode was released, we'd be talking about with my team at Pentagram. So it's like, oh, my God, did you see the last episode? Um, so two shows that keep you there. And what about a guest? So who would you like us to interview or have a conversation in the podcast next? A new guest. Hmm. Let me think about this for a second. And just like off, off, off recording, uh, are you still thinking about somebody who's yeah. in design or art or is it more of like a general? In general, anybody that you think you'd love to learn more from or hear from, you know, that we would be interested to be a part of the show with us. All right. I might be biased here because the person that I'm going to mention is a partner uh, of mine, a pentagram and also a dear friend. His name is Andrea Trabuco Campos and he just joined pentagram as a partner. He's a young incredible designer he's italian originally and colombian at the same time so he has these two cultures moved to the united states pretty early in his life and he has such a deep understanding for design and cultures and philosophy he was trained as a philosopher even before becoming a designer and i find his approach to design to be so particular that i think it can open minds no that's a great suggestion well we're gonna get to it
great. I'm going to send you his. This is exciting. George, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I know we've been back and forth for a bit, but I knew it would be worth it. I knew it would be worth every single minute. And it has been such a joy oh. to hear your story and get you to know a little bit more. Thanks. So excited about the book. So keep us posted. Are you uh, exhibiting or doing anything in Saloni uh, in April? Not this year. Uh, I have been, if I okay. have to be completely honest, uh, a little bit of avoiding the Salone for the past few years. I just, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's a lot. There's so much going on that I like to go yeah. to and see my friends where there isn't a ton going on. Perhaps just because I've been abroad for so many years that when I go back, I actually want to spend time with the people. But um, no, I'm not. But Yuri, it's been such a pleasure. This has been really fun and I hope inspiring for your listeners. Likewise. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye.